are my essential question for the project, a little introduction, some history of women in the workforce, women in business today, challenges women in business face, some marketing strategies, and getting your name out there, my field research, and a conclusion. So my essential question for this project was women in business and what does it take? A little introduction. Owning a business as a woman in today's day and age has a lot more to it than what an outsider can see on the surface. When a consumer is buying from a business, they see things like website design, marketing on social media and other platforms, they see product options and prices. What they don't see is the amount of work and the many challenges and hardships women face. Women have evolved through history in, with business and it is remarkable to witness. Some history. The 20th century was the start for real changes in the female working climate. Prior to this, women owned businesses only if they were in difficult situations, such as those without husbands who did not want to become social burdens. In the early 1900s, powerful female entrepreneurs, such as Madame C.J. Walker and Coco Chanel, created their own brands and fought with every available means for success in the many challenges they faced. World War II marked a time when the percentage of working women rose by nearly 10% due to male military enlistment, which left gaps in the workforce. Women took up a variety of positions, from sewing clothes to repairing planes. After the war ended, many continued their trades, earning independent incomes. One of the most noteworthy is Elizabeth Arden, the woman who single-handedly established the American beauty industry in 1910, and she is the woman in the image. 1960 and 1970s. Women saw great changes in their political and social landscapes. Divorce rates escalated, which led to an increase in working single mothers. Many women saw entrepreneurship as the ideal solution. The American feminist movement finally broke down barriers for women in the workplace, leaving behind the idea that women had to be homemakers for society to accept them. When women earned legal rights and began branching out from typical jobs to explore the larger business sphere. 1980 to 2000, hundreds of women earned recognition as some of the world's most successful entrepreneurs. From Madonna to Martha Stewart and Oprah, establishing their empires, business women were finally in the spotlight. In 1988, Congress passed the Women's Business Ownership Act, which allowed, business to, which allowed women to own their own bank cards without the requirement of their husband's signature on business documents. The act also enabled women entrepreneurs to apply for government contracts. The act assisted in the success of female entrepreneurs, providing policies and programs to support their business endeavors. It marked the start of workplace equality among American men and women. The 21st century has seen an upsurge in women entrepreneurs, but isn't easy still. Female business owners still face wage and gender discrimination and fewer opportunities than their male counterparts. Still, women are making major impacts and have started some of the most successful companies to date. Working women of today. There are more than 13 million women-owned businesses in America today, with numbers still rising. There are many business development programs assisting women with funding and resources, including advice and counseling. We are also seeing many groups being created by women to convene, connect, collaborate, and celebrate. Women Entrepreneurs, based in Burlington, Vermont, is an example of one of these programs. Their goal is to produce digital content and experiences to support and promote a thriving community of women-owned businesses. The phrase collaboration over competition is easier said than done, but it is an important mindset shift that motivates one to flourish, uplift, and allows for all parties to succeed. Some challenges that women in business face include comparing oneself to others, overworking, high standards held, stress, harsh self-critique, ideas plummeting, balancing other jobs and a personal life with their business, getting poor feedback from clients, financial struggles, marketing-related struggles, sexism in the workplace, and many more. Um, marketing and getting your name out there. What is marketing? Marketing is promoting the selling of products or services, including market research and advertising. Marketing is important because it allows you to share your products and services with an audience strategically. It helps you tell, show, and prove to people how great your business is and how you can help them. One of the most common marketing strategies is word of mouth. Word of mouth happens when consumers talk about a company's product or service to their friends and family. 
One form of marketing includes other forms of marketing include social media, email, advertisement, and many more. Marketing is about believing in yourself and what you're selling, getting your name out there, and attracting clients and business. Um, now I will discuss my field research and what I did to uh, explore this topic a bit more. Um, an overview of what I did. As part of my field research, I got a chance to work with a few local women entrepreneurs. I interviewed, researched, and observed from these women. As part of, as every business is different, I was able to gain more perspective from each individual and how they run their business. First, we have Braylon Gillespie. Braylon was my mentor for this project. She owns Be Love Herbals, an herbal business with the intention of nourishing and promoting self-care and nat with natural herbs and products. She also co-owns Rhinoscaping, a landscaping business with her husband Ryan for 20 years, doing bookkeeping and accounting. This is Crystal. Crystal Stokes uh, was the first woman-owned business owner I got the pleasure of interviewing. Crystal has three businesses, including artist, property management, and real estate. And underneath her property management business, she also owns a housekeeping business. Next we have Carrie. Carrie Crozier is a graphic designer and marketing manager. She has started many businesses in her lifetime, including catering, nanny matching, sold products at farmers markets, and more. She is currently diving into leadership consulting and group facilitation. And finally, we have Jesse Upson. Jesse is the co-owner, along with her sisters, running the Crestbury Farmhouse and Whetstone Wellness. Along with that, she is a liver, labor and delivery nurse who works two shifts a month at the hospital and is about to venture into a new business offering medical, intuitive, energetic healing. Some takeaways that I was able to get from these women. Um, being able to learn from mistakes, recover, and adjust matters more than not making any mistakes at all. Organization is key for a smooth operation. Give yourself enough hours each week to recuperate from the mental and physical stress that you put on your body. Be ambitious, ambitious, take chances. Create the small, celebrate the small wins, believe in yourself. Being 10 steps ahead at all times can help with knowing what could potentially go wrong and knowing where to take a step back. Setting boundaries is extremely important. It is important to know to not overwork yourself, to stay mentally and physically well, and to stay on your own path. And it's always okay to say no. And finally, my conclusion. What this project and all four of these wonderful women have taught me are the awards one experiences when you aren't afraid to take chances and you leave with your heart. Being creative and innovative is a skill that needs to be developed, and when we put it to work, we can improve and learn so many lessons about life and ourselves. Although starting your own business is not easy, it can be a very rewarding and empowering path. The struggles we face as women may set us back, but it's up to us to push forward and do what we love. Accomplishing something great and having a ripple effect for good in the world is all that is in the world, in the end, is all that matters. I loved how all of these women have dabbled in various journeys of entrepreneurship, setting great reminders that nothing is permanent, and it's always okay to switch it up. And then finally, just my sources. Um, I guess now I open up the floor to questions. If anyone has any questions for me. Um, when you touched base a little bit on Crystal Stokes' slide, it said that she was your first um, woman-owned business that you interviewed. Mm -hmm. Can you just highlight a little bit, like what emotions you went through as a first time, you know, reaching out to someone and asking yeah. questions and like yeah. what that was like for you? Um, so I, I've never really interviewed before, so I was very nervous. Um, but I had collected a few questions that I asked each of these women, all the same questions. And um, I just, I was able to ask them. She gave me a bit of perspective on what, um, how this, these things impact her and her business. And I was just able to gain a better perspective from a different side of life. You had a slide that had a graph on it, I think. Maybe it was like oh, two yeah. before this, and I didn't have a chance to take a look, and I just wanted to see what was, what yeah. was on there. So what, what is on the, the x-axis? Um, the so this is challenges and the percentage of women, I believe, mm -hmm. that face these challenges. Um, the blue highlights the startup phase, and the red is the present. Um, some of the challenges uh, include financial marketing-related 
and personal and warm. So this was like a, a survey of, of women, yeah. women entrepreneurs? Cool. Yeah. And that was the US based one? I believe so, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Any other questions? What are you wanting to do? I'm just curious. Well, sure. I, um, with this project, I actually was able to realize that I wanted to go to college to um, major in business. So that's what this project has like, really influenced me with. Um, I'm not really sure what business I would be into. Probably something to do with photography, because I'm into photography, but I'm not really sure. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, and did anything come up of um, like Crystal, meeting with Crystal? Like house cleaning or? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Crystal Stokes, as I said, owns a housekeeping business under her property management. And um, I mentioned that I was interested in cleaning, and now I work for Crystal, which is <laughs> pretty cool. <laughs> so, yeah. Any comments? Okay. Cool, well, nice work. The agenda for tonight is going to be supply costs such as feed and pay, equipment costs such as tractors slash vehicles and fuel, then the maintenance costs, uh, building coops, I'm also going to talk about mental health. All right, so when becoming a farmer, you learn a new life, you know. Before getting into farming, you should take a business. Make a business plan and be mentally prepared for life that you're going to lead. Uh, there's a lot of uh, gain from farming, not just for yourself, but for the community. And it can really change the outlook on the small things in life. Uh, feed costs, hay, you know, there's square bale, so it kind of depends on each you know, person that sells. So it could be anywhere from 15 to, or 5 to 15 you know, plus, I'd say. Uh, then a brown bale, you know, like I said, it depends on person selling, could be by pounds, uh, 100 to 175 uh, feed. Go feeds around 20 to 30 bucks, depending on what you get. You know, there's all different kinds. Uh, pig, 20 to 30 bucks as well. Uh, chicken and duck at our farm that I work at, uh, they take the same combo and pellet. So that's around 12 to 25 per bag, like 45 or 40 pound bag. Then the bunny food, you know, 15. Any questions so far? Just, so I, I'm woefully uninformed about this. Are these like per day costs in terms of uh, like the feed more, per day, or what's the unit that we're talking about here? Depends on how much hay you get. So yeah. if you were to just get one, that would probably last you like a few days. And then in terms of the like, you know, the, the feed for each of the I'd animals. I'd say a week. We that's a week. Okay. These are weekly weeks. costs. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Yep. Uh, equipment costs. I'm going to talk about the tractor that we had at the farm, uh, a 583E John Deere. The new one would be around 60k. Uh, we, my, my mentor got his for around 40 with a uh, bucket. Um, and yeah, you can get other tackles for it as well, but, you know, cutting grasses and such. Um, a truck, I say, any truck that best suits you. And the work that you're going to be doing, if you're going to be hauling hay, you know, you might want a bigger truck, such as this one here, it's a third gen Dodge Cummins. Uh, fuel. Well, I'll just talk about it because I linked it, but fuel now is around, I'd say, on AAA, it says that it's around 409 in Vermont. For diesel, it's around 507, I think I saw tonight. So, you know, if you have to fill up a 120 gallon tractor tank, you know, that's a lot of money. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, maintenance costs, and we'll talk about pens that you know, we'd have to repair. Wooden posts, around 13 bucks per post. This was on Traction Supply website that I saw. For an eight foot post. Staples, to staple the fencing, it's around 15 to 30 bucks for a five pound box. Uh, fence, fencing, you know. Chicken, chicken wire, 90 bucks for a 180 foot bundle. Any questions? Okay. Uh, as 
just like, okay, so field risk, research, I'm going to talk about more like day that I would go through on the weekends. So I'd wake up around 6, about <laughs> sometimes I ate, uh, you know, bathroom needs, brush your teeth, shower, use the restroom, uh, breakfast, take a good time on that. We have a list at our farm that we go through now step by step, and it really helps us you know, get, get stuff done. Uh, so I go over the list, and then in the morning we feed all the animals and water them. So we have, as of right now, we have a pen of chickens, so probably around 10 to 12. We used to have over 120. Uh, yeah, that, was, that was a fun time. <laughs> so we just have a pen of chickens and a duck, and we have two pigs. We've got a goat, we had multiple goats. They sadly passed, but um, yeah. So those are the animals that we feed and water. Um, and then after twelve, you know, whatever needs to be done, if it's cleaning pens or replacing the bedding as well, uh, splitting wood or stacking wood, you know, that's always a fun uh, <laughs> cleaning the house when you track dirt in throughout the day. So you have to clean the house so the next day it's summer. Um, cleaning the hooks off the, of the goats, you know, trimming them, cleaning them. Checking out the animal's health is a big thing because one, one, one day they can look really good and the next one, you know, they can be dying. You have to pay really close attention to that. Um, making sure all the animals are in their pens at night because we have predators. We've had to kill a few just to make sure they don't hurt our livestock. Also checking for eggs when they lay. We've gotten a good amount of eggs over the past year. Uh, as, as my conclusion, as you can see, the cost of becoming a farmer is pretty high. Uh, you have to spend money to make money, you know, but sometimes you don't, you don't always have that money to spend. That's why you need to make a crucial plan to make sure you can feed and water these animals and to get the equipment you need to do that. Uh, these are my sources. I just want to say thank you to my mentor Brandon, um, Mr. Smith, Ms. Miller, and Mr. B. Thank you. Questions? <laughs> Yet again. Yes, Ms. Miller. Uh, describe one really stressful experience you had Over summer, someone that worked on the farm made a pretty big mistake. I actually forgot to talk about that, so I want to go back real quick. Uh, your mental health um, it causes stress. You know, sometimes you have to work into the night, sometimes in the morning as well. I've had multiple days where I get two hours of sleep and wake up yet again at six. I do the same thing over again. Very stressful. Um, when stress comes, we make mistakes, and those mistakes can be a big price. So, uh, back to your question, Ms. Miller. Over summer, we had a, uh, someone helping us on the farm, and we bought over $100, $100 worth of hay, and that, that can go a long ways. It got covered up with tarp, and you know, it rained, and then the sun would know, do it over and over again. So the steam would go up, and it just created black mold throughout the whole hay. So we can't use that anymore. Mm -hmm. So. That mistake, you know, like 100 bucks and no, no hay and feed or bedding. So, mis you know, stress causes mistakes. You know, eventually costs money. So, yeah. And then, when we got, this was Bammy. <laughs> we drove four hours away to go get him. It's probably the cutest one out of all of them. Sadly, passed away. But um, go far, four hour and hour away to go get him. He was adorable. That was probably a good time. That was definitely a good time. So yeah. Any more questions? Were you involved in like selling anything, or I'm just curious, like with the um, chickens and stuff like that? Uh, no, because you have to get a license okay. to sell products to the community. Okay. But for like family and you know source, you know. 
Granny would, you know, like kill off a chicken. And then if we needed food, he would definitely give to the family. It's going for family consumption right now. Yeah. I was just curious. Yep. That's a lot of money. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't thought, all right. For a week of feed, you know, I would be over like 200. That's nice. But, yeah. So. Are you ready to run your own farm? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm interested, you talk about, mis you know, getting too hard to sleep and, and mistakes leading to, or stress leading to mistakes and the mental health element. What if, like, what were some strategies you used to try to take care of yourself? Like, were there times when you were able to step away and, like, do something that wasn't farming? Oh, uh, yeah, you know, every weekend, you know, I'd go up to friends, have some work, and then I'd go home. But, uh, Sleep is key. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. Or a ten. <laughs> <laughs> then a Red Bull. So. Um, yeah, you can always you know, walk away for a little bit, come back to it, get your mind going. Um, yeah. Any more questions? question. Um, I'm going to introduce my topic and then I'm going to talk about the roles managers play in sports. Um, I'm going to give a couple examples, um, do a little overview of my field experience, um, and then talk about my experience and then my conclusion. Okay, my essential question was how does managing a sports team influence player satisfaction and scoring success? Um, so my introduction and Team managers for sports have many different roles and responsibilities. Um, managers have to make sure they have good speaking and communication skills, organization skills, and time management skills. Uh, managers also need to support the players, for example, creating a safe environment for players to feel comfortable and be able to talk to people in. Managers need to be able to multitask and succeed in all roles that they're put into. Um, so roles. Managers play, managers, they serve many different roles. Uh, having extra help and support will impact players in a positive way, both on and off the field. And then just like make sure we have a couple examples of like roles that managers play. Role one, an example is business. Managers for college teams and beyond must be able to handle the, the business side of sports, uh, the business side of Sports can be a really tr tricky thing to handle. They have to be able to do marketing, uh, being able to more promote the sport and get fans and spectators to come and watch. College sports and high school sports sometimes charge money for games and they sell tickets, so managers have to you know, 
figure out how much the team can get, how much they have to pay for like busing and all that, and then the money that the team gets, um, they just have to use for to buy new uniforms and gear and equipment for the team. Uh, getting new gear and equipment can really help out the team, um, prepare them for their games and events. Having new equipment to train with can really help out athletes and get them to be more in shape. Uh, and it will most likely increase their chances of winning games because they'll be more ready with more new equipment. Plus, managers also have to pay for equipment that gets broken and things like that. Role two uh, is getting new players. Managers are responsible for being able to bring in new athletes and getting more people to play. Uh, getting more athletes involved will really help the team. Teams need lots of people to play. They need subs. If players get tired or injured, having subs uh, it will help out during the game, but also at practice. They can, if there's enough players, they can show up to practice and play like they would actually play in a real game. If they have enough people, it'll definitely benefit everyone on the team. And just having extra players will help out with people who are tired or get injured and all like that, like I said. Uh, yeah, and it will. Role three creating a safe environment, having a safe environment for athletes is a must. Uh, athletes need to feel safe and trusted in order to, to perform their best. Having someone to talk to and someone to lean on is very important. Um, getting someone, having someone to talk to and trust will help athletes feel safer and more focused on their sport. So they're not just in their heads about it, they have someone to actually talk to. And then here's a, I just got a photo of Roles managers play in general. Like, they have to have leadership, be leaders and monitors and entrepreneurs, stuff like that. And then my experience, my field experience, um, so for my field research, I helped out and managed the girls' varsity team here. I got to work with Gabby and Mariah. Uh, Gabby was my mentor. She was the assistant coach. She kind of let me follow around and help her and watch what she did, and kind of show me that. Um, my experience, uh, I learned a lot of different skills, what managing the basketball team. I think that having more coaches and people to like lean on can help the players a lot. Uh, I gained a lot of skills like time management, I had to manage, so I was also on the basketball team too. So I was the manager, I was on the team plus school, and I also have work. Uh, I had to speak to a lot of different people and organize things, like I helped get backpacks and they got new warm-ups, so I had to like, write all that down and give it to Mariah and stuff. So that was a lot. And then my conclusion, uh, in conclusion, having a manager to help out a sports team increases player satisfaction and scoring rate. Um, Having someone to help them on and off the field is very important. Having someone to lean on and talk to is a need for all athletes. Having someone there to take the pressure off will help athletes focus more on their sport and help them perform better. And it'll just make them want to work harder and be better. And make them help them win and feel good about playing. your role um, as a manager that you also had to play <laughs> yeah. because there wasn't enough players. So, yeah. Yeah. So I just excited to that. <laughs> yes. What strategies did Mariah and, uh, and Gabby use for creating that safe environment that you felt like were really valuable to you as a player? Um, like after practice sometimes, we would all like sit down <coughs> in a circle and talk about what we thought went well in practice, what went bad, and we would, after games too, we would all talk about that. We would like sit in the locker room for like 10 minutes and just throw out what we did right and what we can work on. And it just, it was really nice. And they were like, they were like, you can talk to us about anything, they didn't judge us in any way. It was nice about that. What's something that really surprised you about sports management? I, I thought it was going to be really easy, but it wasn't. <laughs> everybody. 
everybody and like if like if people like cancel games they have to like reschedule them and like all that and it's, it's a lot. <laughs> Do you think being a player at the same time helped you or hindered your ability to be an effective manager? And then, not in your case specifically, but like in general, do you think the player like manager model works, or do you think that there needs to be some separation there? Um, for me, I think it helped because I didn't really know how to play basketball. I didn't know how to work, so that helped me. But I think for like managers who manage like college teams and stuff like and beyond that.